All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second session of Resilience Untangled. Uh, before getting started, we would like to remind you for uh, that for interpretations, please, please select the globe icon and select your preferred language. Um, hola a todos, bienvenidos a nuestra sesión de Resilience Untangled. All right. Sorry. <clears throat> Bienvenidos a nuestra segunda sesión de Resilience Untangled. Antes de empezar, me gustaría recordarles que para interpretación, por favor, seleccionen el icono de idioma en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom para seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. I am Osvaldo Del Bray, a Master in Architecture student in GSAP um, and one of four shares at Latin GSAP. We at Latin GSAP are very happy to join this collaboration with these other four groups. For those of you who just joined, we just had our introductory panel, Notes on Resilience, with a wonderful group of academics from all four schools trying to open up the scope and question the term resilience. This next session I find to be very exciting because we are looking at how students are approaching the term resilience, ranging from environmental, political, and cultural resilience. You'll find a great amount of diversity across their presentations. We hope that throughout this conference, it will be it will become apparent how all these presentations relate. Um, the idea is for students to get to know work that is being done simultaneously on the same topics, and hopefully the work can feed, each, uh, feed from each other. The students will present in a Pesha Kucha format with concise five minute presentations uh, with the intention of sharing an overview of their work. We encourage the audience to chime in, in uh, with questions and comments through the questions tab, and we will discuss them in the end uh, with the Q&A. So we will begin the presentations with MIT student Michelle Mueller. Michelle, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you all see it? Yes. Great. OK. Um, buenas tardes. My name is Michelle. I'm a second year master's student at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. I'm honored to be here on Earth Day. Um, my research is on the political ecology of landscapes. I'm interested in large scale environmental management and how it intimately pe shapes people's lives and how people make sense of contemporary environmental happenings. Before studying, I worked at 100 Resilient Cities, a global planning program. A part of my work was partnering with the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia University, a research initiative that Kate Orff leads, um, and it considers resilience design approaches to spatialized environmental challenges. The drawings I show are produced by my former colleague and friend, Linda Schilling. Um, and much of our work at the time looked at groups of people who lived along wetlands, tributaries, and rivers in America. Um, I will walk through two projects we worked on to show how two different groups of people thought about resilience at the edge where land meets water. I will then talk about how since studying my thinking on resilience at the edge has evolved. One of the challenges around watersheds and non-built areas in Latin America is the expansion of self-built housing. This is tied to inequality, neoliberal policies, but in the day-to-day -day lives of people, um, there are real risk. Homes are flooded and the lack of sewage and sanitation contributes to water pollution in those areas, just to name a few. The first project was the Pantanoso in Western Montevideo, and the second was the Yaque River in Central Santiago de los Caballeros. Both places use the term resilience, but from my perspective, the former was more grounded in land healing, paired, paired with supportive housing for residents. The latter took a more neoliberal approach, centering economic growth around development of the waterfront and defensive resilient planning. Um, the Pantanoso Basin sits in Western Montevideo. It's an industrial and less affluent part of the city. It's a landscape that has been abused by pollutants, industry, and a practice of domination through channelizing and hard edges. Its water flow is interrupted by development, dumping, and housing on, on the wetlands. This is one of the sites, uh, maybe bringing us to a more localized scale uh, from our earlier conversation. And you can see that the housing is built right up to the wetlands edge. Um, and part of this is it was done by infilling by the um, the state. 
The city of Montevideo has a program to rehouse residents in the areas. They have options to either take funds and buy in the market. Um, the municipality also builds homes across the street as an option for residents. So they don't have to move out of, out of neighborhoods and can be on higher ground. We worked on um, an edge design with them to kind of create this idea of a Rambla extension, um, the path that runs along the seafront. The idea was to program the space so that people could access the Pantanoso wetlands while drawing a boundary between housing and the Pantanoso landscape. The hope is to create habitat without policing the landscape, creating access and education sites that help foster storytelling of the wetland. And now turn to the Yaque River. Um, it's a powerful river that runs through the highlands of the Dominican Republic, Santiago de los Caballeros. This image reminds me of the power of the river. Um, some residents have built housing along the edge, many of them Haitians. In 2007, there was a strong Caribbean storm that opened up, um, the city opened up the floodgates of a dam upstream. They didn't give the residents living along the edge enough notice to evacuate, and many people lost their homes and lives. As a response, the municipality has um, actually been using defensive design. They have densely planted trees along the edge so that people do not do not repopulate the landscape. There's a proposed levy um, that would serve to block water and people from the edge. And the restoration of the landscape has been tied to tourism opportunities and economic growth. Um, this to me represented an approach of working against the river and people under the name of resilience. Uh, we sought to expand the planning to consider providing housing, redesigning the edge approach and a larger river restoration, um, looking at all the tributaries. In my research at school, I've moved away from the term of resilience. To me, it's a term that sometimes is used to plan and manage landscapes and consequentially people. And managing it sometimes falls into engineering or defensive ways, like in Santiago. Other times it decides where nature is and where people are, sometimes foreclosing other ways of being. Um, I now think about how we can co-conspire with the plants, people, and critters, and landscapes to create these alternative futures we all desire. I read the words of Catherine McKittrick, Sylvia Winter, a Jamaican scholar, Natasha Myers, and Robin Will Kimmerer to show me how humans have historically worked with the natural world. Sylvia Winter teaches me about the plantation plot where Black slaves in the Caribbean acted in resistance to, to the discipline of slavery by planting complex gardens that both created space for species and nourished people. Natasha Myers and Robin Will Kimmerer teach me how we can attune ourselves to the natural world and use storytelling as a way to move forward seeing plants as our allies and teachers. Um, I've been a bit separated from the Caribbean and Latin America in my current work. I'm looking at the city of Tampa, Florida, but I think that some of these, these scholars can help us think about edge designs in the future as sites of regeneration, resistance, co-conspiracy and healing. Perhaps an edge that doesn't fall into binaries of where water and people should or ought to be. Um, and to answer Diane Davis, I think that we can start to use our storytelling and daily practices of working with the earth to create these imagined futures in the present. Um, and I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Michelle. We're, we're gonna move now to Danny Lopez and Betsabe Valdez from MIT also. So here we go. We're Denny and Bethoe. I'm a PhD student at MIT, but we were, we are going to show work that we did at, in, during our master's at the GSC. And it's here. So it all started like this. It's a river in the south of Mexico, where all the rubble from the 2017 earthquake is put on the site. Everything that you see in one side or the other is a rubble from one of the towns in, that we were exploring. And it's how we got interested in this in this area in the beginning. What happened is that in 2017, there were three earthquakes in Mexico. The first was the, the, the strongest of the century, an 8.2 earthquake in the south, in Oaxaca, Chiapas. And then we had one in Mexico City. So if you ever heard about the earthquake in 2017, you probably heard about the one in Mexico City. And then we had another one in the south. It, they, were, they all happened in the span of 10 days. What happened from this is that in Mexico City, Civil society was very organized because it had previous experiences to build them, but in Oaxaca they had it. So 
the army uh, took over, the federal government took over, and the response that happened was very different, much more disorganized and broken down. Uh, the site that we were studying was in this area called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, uh, near the junction of three tectonic plates, where many of the municipalities are subject to earthquakes in the Ring of Fire. However, plans are not made for this area, they are made for Mexico City. This is exactly the area that we are talking about inside the Black Circle. It's five towns who were the most affected in the whole country by the series of earthquakes. They lost uh, approximately 58% of their houses in the five towns combined. There were other problems that the area was already dealing with. This is one of the poorest areas in Mexico. It's comparable to the to Botswana, for example, while... Um, May I ask, are you switching your uh, slides? Yeah, you are not seeing anything. We're still seeing the first river. Uh oh. I don't know how to, what to do about this. Uh, <laughs> what are you seeing now? It's still uploading. Nothing. It still it still says uh, that you're sharing, so it's still kind of loading. I don't. Should I just tell you what we did? <laughs> yeah. Let me see if we can share. So I think. Let me see if one of us can share the screen and and. Move the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think if Paola or, or Maria. Okay. Thank you, Paola. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Just keep clicking through. All right. Uh, yeah, we we're on slide. I don't even know. What it's there, perfect. Sunny Mexico. It's like ten or fifteen slides more. A, a little bit more, please. I'm really sorry about this. But, <laughs> never mind. In any case, we went to Mexico uh, as a form of student organization between three students at the GSD, one in landscape architecture, one in critical conservation. I was in urban design and digital resilience. And we gathered funds from, from the university and from the government here in Mexico to start research with the community. So we did a park project that lasted for approximately three months and figured out that there were many needs, but particularly there was a need for the community to be producing their own information. And we worked with them to produce information that was missing in, in policy and in, that was gonna be missing in the response in the long term. So there are many things that you can check out. We have a website, I'll write it in the chat. We developed a lot of projects, thesis, publications, projects with women, projects with um, to rebuild with rubble. Uh, we did a traveling exhibition too. So it's it's just to say that this thing became it snowballed into a larger project. I'm now working on it on my PhD, and I'm happy to share the website. I'm really sorry about the technological issues. Uh, I can pass it on to whoever's next. But I don't want to take your time. Worry. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, Ken Ismael Santiago Pagan from DSD. Hi, guys. Thank you. I will be sharing screen now. <clears throat> Let me know if you guys can see that. 
Can you guys see it? Right? Cool. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Ken Ismael Santiago Pagan, and I'm a first year student at the MDES program within the Risk and Resilience Concentration at the GSD, and I'm super honored to be here. Um, so my presentation is titled uh, Collecting Acts of Resilience, uh, Resistance in Bayamón. Uh, resilience is a scratch off to reference Maria Caica's piece, Don't Call Me Resilient Again, where she argues that we should stop focusing on how to make citizens more resilient, uh, as this would only mean that they can take more suffering, deprivation, or environmental degradation in the future and focus instead on identifying the actors and processes that produce the need to build resilience in the first place. The later being something that the government of Puerto Rico can benefit from, as it has relied too much on the resilience of the community instead of addressing the core problems that have forced us to be resilient. In this case, I'll be highlighting resistance in Bayamón, a municipality of Puerto Rico, and I will be showing a brief, uh, very brief excerpts from my MR thesis and some of the work I've been doing in the MDES expanding on the topic. So my EMARC, uh, my EMARC research was focused on modern urban residences and how they have been transformed without architects to the commercial venues we find in avenues that were not originally conceived or sown for this type of social interaction. What I wanted to prove is that extra legal transformations like the ones you see on the right made to urban residences like the ones you see on the left are a form of resistance in a war of social classes within the increasingly rapid urbanization process of the US territory Puerto Rico. Now, the original model, extreme left, was uh, mass produced in the 60s, mainly to returning war veterans. And I was trying to survey how they got transformed into the images you see on the right. Because, because there is no formal documentation of these properties, I had to make us build to unpack their creative problem solving skills in response to their shortcomings and without compliance to the zoning regulations and permit processes, because they simply just can't afford to hire a licensed uh, professional. It is, important, it is important to address the many vulnerabilities these residents are subjected to. Although they are owners of their properties, their transformations are in a sense extra legal because the state is not able to recognize anything that is built without the proper legal procedures, which are in itself a form of power in place. According to a former uh, head manager of the Permit Management Office of Puerto Rico, those zoning codes are literally adapted from the ones in the US and are purposely edited to be confusing and intimidating so that the people feel obliged to hire to hire a professional. And so a fundamental part of my thesis was to diagram and visualize what the design parameters were requesting, the image on the left. And to my surprise, they, they didn't even take into consideration what is actually happening on site. Um, so what, what can be done? In response to that, I propose an amendment to the codes that directly engages with the mixed commercial residential atmosphere of the region. Uh, there's much more to it, but here's uh, an image of the final outcome of the intervention. Um, and so departing a bit from formal discourses, uh, what I've been trying to expand at the MDES uh, courses seminars is trying to map those acts of resistance to really unpack um, broader arguments concerning social political issues of post-colonial conflicts and the political economy of space. Uh, from the original model, built exactly 10 years after the first ever concrete urbanization in Puerto Rico, we are able to get an insight on many extra legalities that the people resort to in order to transform their properties. But most of them being about diversifying their finances in order to keep up with the bureaucratic processes and economic struggles that the island has always faced. The later being what they are trying to resist. Uh, in my opinion, in order to address uh, resistance, uh, we must channel into advocacy as practice. So my efforts for this uh, was creating a radical archive that decenters the Western canon of the island. The idea is to create an archive that fills the gaps of an unfinished history with undocumented fragmented stories of marginalized communities, along with their bodily experiences within the architecture that is not made by architects in the oldest colony of the world. These efforts are supposed to be made in collaboration with local residents to document their house through drawing. The idea of advocating for the inclusion of the people within the same 
recopilation of data is fundamental for a crowdsourced archive that contests questions of class around the politics of knowledge production. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Kenny. We're now moving, moving on to GSAF student, Oscar M. Caballero. Hello, um, I will start sharing. I will give it a few seconds. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Oscar M. Caballero. I recently graduated from the Advanced Architectural Design Master at GSAF, and I'm currently practicing as an architectural designer and researcher in New York. Um, this is a self-initiated research where I explore the resilience of disembodied monuments memory and the process of urban deconstruction in my home country, Nicaragua. This quote from my last studio at GSAP with Professor Galia Solomonov resonated with me. Thinking about the cycle of impermanence and urban deconstruction in my country, this effect sharpened critically since the re-election of Daniel Ortega in 2007, almost 15 years ruling the country now. Currently, Nicaragua has been under a state of emergency since 2018 when a protest against government's reforms in the Institute of Social Security was only the start of a complete sociopolitical reckoning. Ortega's political propaganda and iconography have completely infected our media, our streets, our buildings, and even our schools where children are indoctrinated with propaganda in their history books. This dictatorial dynamic has been used to erase urban memory and rewrite it as they please. Over the last 14 years, we have witnessed the mass production of elements of propaganda in different scales of operation. A monument means nothing without a context. That's why the alienated nature of these artifacts has turned them into extensions of the regime itself. Oftentimes, as it is nothing more than part of the lapses of history in the making, a living force defining its present based on its past. In this dynamic, monuments become placeholders of time, symbols of history, human achievement, and resilience. We are a country of short memory and resources even shorter. This is how journalism Elio Arajona refers to the mania of governments to destroy what was built by their predecessors. Um, by 2014, three of the most important monuments in Managua, capital of Nicaragua, were said to be demolished by the Ortega Murillo regime. Regardless of the nonsense excuses and unlawful actions took to approve their demolition, there was a clear manipulation of the historic memory of the city and its relationship with earthquakes. La Concha Acústica, El Faro de la Paz, y La Rotonda Plaza Inter, were turned to rubble in about a week. However, seven years later, the essence of this monument is still there, occupied by a different body, but embedded in a parallel time as a ghost memory that refuses to be forgotten. Rotonda Plaza Inter, designed by architect Glenn Small, was one of the first ones to be destroyed, and now it's occupied by one of the most protected symbols, the Hugo Chavez Altar. El Faro de la Paz, designed by architect Nelson Brown, commemorated the first defeat of Ortega in the 90s and the end of the Civil War where all weapons were fused into the foundations of the lighthouse, now turned into a recreation pool. La Concha Acústica evoked the Momotombo volcano fire moving through the breeze of the Lake Salotan. It was designed by architect Glenn Small and commissioned by Major Hector Levites, the closest contender of Ortega for the presidency before his sudden death before elections. It is one of the few well-documented case studies, and by using traces of digital memory, I mapped a deconstruction pattern used by the regime. This process starts with the vandalism and the addition of political iconography to the existing monument. Artifacts and propaganda are placed, attached, and even inserted into their bodies, causing serious damages to their structural, to their structural stability. Since this vandalism isn't enough, the demolition is the last resource to undo the memory. The alleged unstable structure took seven days to receive the government's heavy machinery. Many other bodies rebuilt in its place as the urban landscape was shaped over the years. But to forget is not as easy anymore. Technology has amplified our collective memory to a point where the physical body of these monuments can become irrelevant through digital archive. The purpose of erasing the memory is clearly defeated by our own desire to, and tools to remember. But how to recognize what deserves to be remembered, either to commemorate or to never let it happen again? How to break a cycle of urban deconstruction that erases our historic memory but also worsens issues like waste, climate, and economy. Buildings can be repurposed and take on new typologies. And on that premise, I dare myself to wonder, 
once this regime is over, is there a way to recontextualize some of these monuments without destroying them? There are 134 steel trees along the capital, Managua, lifeless structures occupying many times space taken from nature. But if, what if we design their decay, a decay by nature? Then slowly we revert the scale of power and these artifacts become an infrastructure useful for the city to amend the impact of climate and drastic temperature changes over the years. What if we look at them as, as a scaffolding structures that can nurture life where those artificial colors fade and the colors of nature take over, where urban animals and birds can find a place to nest and we can find a starting point to reconcile with our past without forgetting its aftermath. Thank you. I will stop. Kristen? Thank you, Fred. Right now. We'll now have Natalia Revelo from UPenn. Everyone see the screen? Go with yes. this. Okay. Hi, so I'm Natalia Reola Rota, and I'll be presenting some of the research of my ongoing thesis project, currently titled Designs for Autonomy, a case study of Rio de Janeiro's favelas as a speculative experiment for equitable communities. This presentation will take you briefly through my underlying research and offer a glimpse into the framework of the analysis of spatial agency of favelados. I begin this work with a comparative research of water access of Rio's planned city and, and favelas which led to the categorization of different approaches that Plan City has taken towards favelas in an effort to understand the root of this inequality. To give a brief introduction, here's a comparative diagram of the flow of water in Rio. Rio's water and sewage system is like most Western urbanized areas. It is centralized, it brings water from far away and distributes it to the Plan City via underground pipes. Where it differs is in the way and the frequency it provides water to favelas. Favelas, favelas have reported weeks and in some places even months without access to water. Others have reported that the water and the sewage get mixed, while others have to rely on water trucks to bring in a weekly ration of water that are distributed to their caches de agua. This is a met at a time when Rio's water service is slated to be privatized, which would exacerbate the existing inequality with Rio's access to water and sewage. Yet community initiatives like the water societies of Moja de Formiga provide an alternative and decentralized approach to providing water to people outside of a capitalistic model. This research helped to illuminate the unequal relationship favelas have with the planned city, with water acting as a demarcator of inequality that is rooted in capitalism, colonialism, and racism, as well as shed light to existing alternative means to common practices. This research then branched off to the historic analysis of this relationship. Where there's a long history of the planned city intervening with favelas, which are very depending on who is in power. This bluish gray shade is a part of Rio's history that directly relates to colonialism, which set up a lot of the economic and social divisions we see today. The lightest blue here is eradication, characterized by neglect and violent removals, large scale removals that are usually triggered by the preparation of mega events, such as the centennial celebration of independence, World Cup and the Olympics, generally as a way to show um, themselves to the world. The, this mid-tone blue is reurbanization, characterized by the community's location being accepted, but with an emphasis on changing how the community looks like and operates like. For example, the imposition of social housing. At times, you can see that reurbanization and removal overlap as people get shifted around to spaces that are being torn down to make way for the social housing. The darkest blue is urbanization. This approach is characterized by the weaving of the community into the existing planned city by providing infrastructure and amenities, but respecting the community's identity and organization. This is best exemplified by the Favela Bajo program. And then here, the, the timeline ends at 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, when we can see a trend of resurgence of removal with Brazil's new right-wing governments and new preparations for the world stage, but also highlighting Favela's long-standing approach to mutual aid and self-sufficiency, which I'm characterizing as Dalentro Brafora, which as you have seen has been percolating over time and growing as of now. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how I'm looking at spatial justice and, and spatial advocacy in favelas. And I'm analyzing them under four non-physical frameworks that speak to the spatial agency of favelas, occupation, network, featuring, and commoning. In order to understand um, how these spaces function as an act of resistance, it is important to understand what it is they resist. The first template begins to explore that relationship between occupation and public services based on geographic location, but also its allotment of funding and space. And you can see how larger spaces are generally devoted to police and um, surveillance, where larger spaces are, smaller spaces are for health and care. 
This map then starts to diagram the relationship between residents, community, and even the planned city for the development of this particular case study of Museo La Mare. And it diagrams the social relationships that, that created and sustained the museum. Through the use of collage and spatial analysis, I developed an analysis for how the Museo La Mare utilizes the ideas of featuring and comedy that have made this space so important to the community of Mare. In this case study, Featuring is derived from the development and celebration of a collective history of the 16 communities that make up Complex La Mare. The creation of the space and its non-chronological trajectory guide the visitor through past and present struggles, collective history, and both hopes and fears for the communities of Mare, ending the trajectory with a space of reflection. History in this case is depicted through the collection of items donated and curated by over 100 Mare residents. Though the spatial organization of the case study suggests a linear motion, the curation of the exhibit frames the 12 times of Mare as a series of interrelated struggles, achievements, and celebrations that serve to acknowledge an excluded existence and inspire res residents to imagine a future that includes them. Moving to comedy, the museum exemplifies this by the various activities of development of social, academic, and economic nature that take place here. Most programming here being free of charge and reflective of the needs of the community. The collage here demonstrates a plurality of events that take place here, ranging from celebration to protest to education and more, all with shared resources and knowledge in common, and with the ability to transform space as needed and support the development of autonomous communities. This and other examples that I've been studying through this research demonstrate the vibrant spatial agency of Avalaos and how their alternative approach to providing resources, support, and even Support and even governing have resulted in more just and equitable process to address challenges that make the plants that the plant city has failed to do. This itself is the argument that my design thesis makes as I explore how architecture as a collaborative and engaged approach can support the existence of the work in favelas. Thank you. Thank you, Analia. Um, we're moving on now to Hilary Morales, Morales <coughs> Robles from UPenn. Uh, hey, hola a todos. Thank you for attending. I'm going to start. I'm going to see this. <laughs> so, it is part of your memories of celebrating holidays, such as New Year's, in your neighborhood or at your home surrounded by your loved ones. Fireworks are a symbol of celebration, hope or the dream of beginning a new chapter and attempts to leave something behind in our lives. You might be wondering, what this has to do with resilience? The truth is this, uh, the truth is this video. The truth is this video doesn't mark a national holiday for us. I filmed this video in December 2017 when my town, Tobaja, all the neighbors got back electricity, communication access, potable water, and food security. It was a December, three months after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. The fireworks became a symbol of the end of a chapter of uncertainty and fear that reflected the long-term community resistance against governmental management failure. My coastal hometown, Tobaja, was the first municipality to be declared in a state of emergency during a hurricane. My post-war concrete model home suffered minor damages compared to my close friends who live just a six miles away from my house. My friends experienced a significant loss with the ocean devastated the old housing constructed in the flood zone. Yes, old houses. American preservation ordinances consider historic buildings built over 50 years. The coastal area of Tobaja is one of the largest post-war plant communities in Puerto Rico, developed by Levitt and Sons in 1963. The Levitt and post-war plant community was supposed to be a model of the American dream, a dream that transformed into the Puerto Rican nightmare. My name is Hilary Morales Robles. I'm a research assistant at Climate Change and Heritage and a dual master degree student student in historic preservation architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. A brief description of my hometown can unpack several layers of complexities of existing building stock in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico architecture are spaces of everyday life, shelters of protection against hurricanes and earthquakes, and spaces rooted in culture and local identities. Today, I want to share a list of sustainable preservation design challenges and opportunities based on my experience, not only as a Caribbean and Puerto Rican, but as a community member 
activist designer, preservationist, and an incessant learner. Also through a series of case studies, policy dissertations, and design exploration from the last five years. So I want to start first with the first challenge is sustainable design practices. Are design professional passive capitalist servants or are we active social cultural actors? For a long-term designers work for the private sector, in my personal belief, sustainable practice needs to understand or work with different levels of governance and a desired power. Who has it, how they're using it, and for what purpose? This is my experience in Ecuador in 2016. I work in a disaster relief project after the earthquake. And we work alongside with the community and the public government to create a series of interventions across the coastline for economic revitalization projects. I'm sorry. We work with 300 architects and it was an incredible experience of community integration. We need to understand community on its own, they are resistant. They are the first responders against climate change. We are the, uh, with, uh, with the community integration, our work together, we can develop a series of opportunities to fight against the climate and protect our heritage at the same time, which leads to the second issue I face in preservation. It's measuring the impact of diversity, equity, and inclusion to ensure outreach and engagement. Designers are experts in process, not in culture. So in order to understand these goals, it must be to implement the theories of social justice, distributive, participative, and restorative. Tools for community participation through interviews and surveys, but we need to understand these challenges are so we need to ensure to give back something to the community and not use them as experiments for personal agendas. There's also an identification of lack of organization or nonprofit organizations uh, that responds to preservation protection. Third, uh, sustainability, preservation, and design values are completely separated. I think it's a huge opportunity for us here in this conference to talk about how cross-disciplinary action can help us to create more sustainable projects in the future. Four, political ideologies and colonial heritage issues. <laughs> I did, made a dissertation in undergrad. Uh, oh, I didn't realize this issue. I'm so sorry, guys. I did a dissertation in undergrad uh, that, uh, that made an observation in how uh, white elephant buildings, bacon, and demolition criteria are based on ideological political idea, uh, power. This is an example of a historic building in Puerto Rico. It's the old train station in Los San Juan that was constructed under the Spanish empire and got demolished after attempts of reshaping our colonial status to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. As a sign of modernity, it was constructed this parking instead. This is an interesting point of topic I talk about in how political ideologies can destroy and erase our heritage. Five, targets for demolition and by neglect and inevitable loss. I think climate and pol politics overall can affect our selection of heritage uh, by thinking about how hurricanes demolish, the, completely demolish this property in Old San Juan, or the earthquake in Ponce, the Museo de la Masacre in Ponce. But also thinking about developers and the lack of regulation and policy. This is an example of El Ciperle. This happened during the aftermath of the Hurricane Maria in 2017, and there was no regulations about protecting this heritage. It's not necessarily historic, but it contains stained glass window from our friend Michaelino Mas, uh, an artist who made uh, also the stained glass window from the La Capilla uh, Mica San Jose in the Viejo San Juan. I can translate that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's trying to apologize. And like we need to, I think this is one of the issues we face in Latin America is that our heritage is being transformed into capitalist products and commodity. Six, affordable housing stock at risk and also preservation opportunities. It's a case study in San Antonio, Texas, where uh, the, uh, this is being rapid demolishing old historic buildings. Uh, but we need to understand that sustainable green buildings are not equally about sustainability. In reality, sustainability relies in, in protecting our current heritage. Uh, there's uh, there's a this uh, report uh, made by Place Economics. Rikema highlighted that historic districts were not creating gentrification or displacement. It was actually new construction. 
So what opportunities that we have in our historic districts to keep affordability in by keeping our heritage as well. Seven, impacts of exploitative tourism. This is our biggest issue right now in Puerto Rico. I think everyone knows <laughs> how tourist behavior com are completely damaging, uh, degrading our material heritage, our streets with <laughs> basically our colonial streets completely ruined, but also our, the public safety uh, when tourist behavior are affecting us by COVID-19 uh, the, and the other measures. So there's a whole uh, debate right now in how to create policy that controls uh, tourist behavior in heritage, in historic districts in Latin America. Six, this is my one of my biggest exp explorations as a designer is balancing historic material integrity and adaptive use projects. Uh, this is a project I made two years, a uh, year ago. Uh, it's in Red Hook in Brooklyn. It's a site that is also facing the water edge. It's a community that is being, uh, that received the uh, damages from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and I found myself dealing with how much I should intervene versus what I should keep uh, to maintain integrity, which uh, it was a beautiful project, I suppose, but I think this is not a question I wanna bring in the table is to how much we can do as an architects or designers to leave our stamp because that's how our, our academia is being enforced to us. Well, also to keep this the historic integrity of our buildings. Uh, also thinking about how we could um, implement housing for mixed income levels, but also spaces for the community integration. I think there's so many complexities around adaptive use and we have this opportunity to implement environmental and sustainability measures to it as well. Nine, uh, design beyond the facade. Uh, I think both in preservation and architecture poses the same issue of we're focused so much about the facade and the closure. Uh, I've been doing research about uh, how to implement uh, measures to quant uh, quantitative tools to create more sustainable adaptive use. Uh, LCA and other uh, related software can allow us to uh, in, uh, think about more the spaces and more create more comfortable spaces. So trying to find the balance between qualitative and quantitative information to create more comfortable spaces for the future. And last but not least is missed opportunities of vernacular sustainable practice. As I mentioned, community are resistant. They know how to deal with climate. In Puerto Rico, we have this subculture called the Jibaros, which means an indigenous Taino people of the forest. And <laughs> they had created a, a full engineering techniques around hurricane shelters that we can explore and use it, this knowledge to adapt our, our existing building stock against the climate. This is my current thesis project, so it's like still new to the table. So what are the challenges and opportunities I think what I just mentioned is not even half of the problems. Also, the issues about ownership and preservation, thinking about World Heritage Site nominations and how they impact in tourism in, for example, Machu Picchu in Peru, as an example, or concepts of desertification in our islands. Uh, there's so many issues. So, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna head, I'm gonna stop right now. Thank you, Hilary. And thank you for also trying to answer some of the questions uh, from the topic. Oh, I, I can stop sharing for some reason. I'm panicking. Don't worry. Can you stop me, please? It doesn't let you, it doesn't let you unshare? I don't know what I did. Oh, my apologies. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to Alice Fang and Luis Miguel Pisano uh, from GISA. Can you see the screen? Yes. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Alice Fang and Luis Mira Pisano. We are graduate students in the Master of Architecture program at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation and co directors of Latin GSAP. I am a design, designer from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Luis Miguel is a Mexican designer based in Brooklyn, New York. Today, we are presenting Fracture of Infrastructure, which envisions the future obsolescence of prisons. We would like to acknowledge that this project was born out of a specific time and place 
which predates many of the conversation that Luis Vega uh, and I had regarding of the role of restorative justice in broader systems that facilitate uh, racism and oppression in the United States. The project has since evolved, directing our research horizons beyond restoration towards abolition. This is part of an ongoing project on climate justice, criminal justice, and equity entitled Beyond Restorative Justice, What Does a Prison Less America Look Like? Our project preempts climatic changes, instrumentalizing trees to fracture the architecture of distance future facility. The programmatic focus of the facility shifts from common data reformation in the 25 years near future to voluntary rehabilitation in the 50 year distant future. Our project sources climate resilient native tree species to enhance sensorial engagement, protect against heat gain, wind and noise and regulate climate conditions. The drip line of these trees delineates the architecture and their maturity defines the project phases. This strategy follows our own new method for the study of holding facilities, coined thermal density, based on ASHRAE variables on radiant temperature, air temperature, and humidity. In the floor plants, the darker the area, the less climatic depth it is. We concluded that the current prison infrastructure will fail to adapt to climatic changes in the future. We recognize that the restorative justice model allows envir environmentally just facilities to prosper. Extensive research suggests that the shift from retribution to restoration will result in, the, in better prison microclimate, lowering the incidence of violence, heat-related illnesses, and recidivism. We believe that focusing on voluntary rehabilitation makes moral, operational, and economic sense. The restorative justice model proposes a framework for conference-based rehabilitation. All parties involved can work through the offense in a collective circle that also invites the community. Study on the substation along a decommissioned electric corridor, we propose a 10 by 10 grid for new foundations that avoids existing substations foundations. Grab on site is processed into ground earth to patch the holes for future tree planting. The thermal density on this system is designed to improve as it constructs construction progresses. In phase one, trees are planted on the nursery grounds and construction begins. In phase two, trees begin to be moved and the first facility is completed through concrete and wood modular construction. In phase three, trees are harvested and ram earth is removed and packed along the drip line boundary. In phase four, the tree planting cycle begins and the second facility emerges through the addition of CLT source from the nursery. This creates an underground network that feeds the equitable spaces above ground and affirms the role of the tree as an organizing agent and climate controller. Our networked approach spans from the micro to the macro scale. The development of this dual future facility network unfolds on the electrical substations, as Alice already pointed out. We focused on the substation closest to urban Newburgh, this is in New York, which offers direct engagement with uh, local communities. Starting in phase two, the tree nursery takes over the grounds of the corridor um, and the court mandated reformation facility is built onto the substation. In phases three and four, the tree nursery extends into the neighboring site as the voluntary rehabilitation facility emerges from the fracture of the court mandated reformation units. The voluntary rehabilitation facility consists of an aggregation of restorative justice blocks, um, a courtyard based system that fosters community accountability and trust. The three essential parts of the block are the restorative justice center residential unit and connective wellness core, producing a continuous loop. The architecture of phase two is constructed to fracture alongside building functions that will become obsolete. For example, the central security room, which prioritizes the visibility of users to the security officers transforms into a tree shaded community courtyard, while the broken fragments that anchor individual kitchenettes 
are repurposed into a shared community kitchen. Each of these parts originates, in a, originates from a pinched residential module that includes a bedroom, full bathroom, and access to private courtyard. Phase four also introduces a wellness core, which connects vertically and offers therapy and recreation space. Gradients of privacy are produced by the orientation of vertical wood slats, which negotiate between public and private spaces. The tree, nursery, and substation network are the raw materials for a cross-laminated timber business. Its cyclical harvesting produces better climate regulation and sustainable construction materials, as well as learning and work opportunities for the users of the restorative justice block. The harvesting and development rights of the corridor land are managed by a proposed public-private partnership between what would be the rehabilitation network, the CLT business, and a future high-voltage community land trust, which would ensure democratic stewardship of as-of-right land use. In contrast to the conventional extractive model of prison labor, work opportunities offered by the partnership to facility users and the community at large um, are designed to be inclusive and career oriented with hourly salaries above minimum wage and prospects for professional certification. In addition to being the source material for the rehabilitation and business networks, the trees define the threshold between individual and community spaces. There are a range of security strategies along the site perimeter from tightly monitored to, to highly porous. We've tailored the form to its security needs through the manipulation of trees and landscape. As the facility transitions, the security softens from slat paced fences to berm formations that assist in stormwater retention. This water system is built into the assembly of the residential block through the addition of prefab awnings and integrated gutters that collect and drain water to feed the underground cistern and irrigate the nursery. We would like to conclude our presentation by questioning how we engage with problematic and obsolescent infrastructures in order to foster the development of resilient communities and climatically resilient frameworks we believe that architects can no longer stand behind neutrality in order to remove themselves from these conversations. Instead, we must acknowledge that which we know and that which we don't know in order to bridge a path into this, these discussions. Uh, thanks so much for having us, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Luis and Alice. We will now move to our final presenter of this session, Andreina Salinas, Sejas from GSD. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Just one second. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. I stop sharing. Okay. Great. So hello, everyone. My name is Andreina Sejas. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I as part of my doctoral studies at the Harvard GSD, I specialized in nighttime governance and planning or the tools and strategies that cities have to manage life at, at, at night. This presentation will draw from my studies as well as from some of my current work. Night studies is a relatively new field that has been growing significantly over the past 30 years, but only recently from an urban planning perspective. In temporal terms, a city's economy can be categorized into the daytime economy, the nighttime economy, and the 24-hour economy. The most used definition of the nighttime economy refers to urban activities that take place between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And it has two dimensions, nighttime production, or those who work at night, and nighttime consumption related to leisure and entertainment. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the nighttime economy has been among one of the most affected sectors. While social distancing is a spatial concept, it also has had very important temporal implications. Curfews and lockdowns have been imposed around the world, leading not only to massive closures and job losses, but also to great confusion and the stigmatization of the night as the space where most infections occur. For the first time ever, New York City subway stopped running 24 hours and Berlin, a city that hadn't had a curfew since 1949, 
saw its vibrant and creative night scene come to a halt. The contemporary notion of urban governance refers to the process through which public and private resources are coordinated by a wide range of actors in the pursuit of collective interests. Similarly, nighttime governance refers to the broad and growing cast of actors that have become involved in managing the city at night. While the police continues to play a central role in this task, there has been a gradual incorporation of other state as well as non-state actors. This refers to official trading bodies, best practice schemes, square guardians, and negotiated agreements, which point to, towards a trend towards collaborative governance at night. And in recent years, a new actor has emerged, the night mayor. In 2018, along with my colleague, Merrick Milan, we embarked on a study, a comprehensive study on the relevance and the significance of the role of the night mayor from an urban governance perspective. And you might be wondering, what is a night mayor? Essentially, night mayors, nighttime offices, offices of nightlife, nighttime ambassadors uh, have been proliferating over the past 15 years around the world. And this is a map that we put together for the study where we identify that there's variations in this role, but essentially what all these offices have in common is that night mayors are mediators between three actors. You have the city government on one hand, residents and the nighttime economy. Today, there are more than 50 cities that have appointed these offices and in Latin America, the first one to do this was Cali in Colombia, followed by Valparaíso in Chile. Also relevant groups and grassroots initiatives have emerged in cities like Asunción, Paraguay and San Luis Potosí in Mexico. And more recently, cities like Bogotá and Colombia are considering the possibility of starting an office of nightlife. Since we published this study, more and more cities have joined this trend, and particularly now in the context of the pandemic, to help cities handle the massive impacts of this lockdowns that I was talking about before. If you're curious about this phenomenon, you can access this interactive map by visiting nighttime.org slash map, where you can actually see which other offices have been joining over the past two years. In this context, the COVID crisis has posed a very important question. So how resilient are nocturnal institutions and ecosystem? The night is a key space to socialize and imposing curfews won't restrict social interactions from happening after dark. As a matter of fact, these restrictions have led to informal gatherings such as illegal parties and concerts that have become super spreader events. So instead of canceling the night, cities should act as enablers of safe spaces to work for work as well as for socialization. In New York City, for instance, flexible sidewalk and alcohol regulations have allowed restaurants to accommodate more customers and new business models to emerge. But this is just one example and uh, one of many examples of resilience. Um, a year ago, a large group of academics, e experts, practitioners and advocates, we came together to work on what we call the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan. And this is a series of chapters that gather practices and solutions to reactivate and recover night scenes in the context of the pandemic. To end, I will, uh, I'm going to share three lessons learned uh, about nighttime resilience and that, that we have obtained from this collaborative work in which I'm very happy to be part of the editorial team. The first lesson is that cities need proactive rather than reactive policies to manage life at night and particularly in context of crisis. Today, there hasn't been a single study that points out a strong correlation between curfews and a reduction of COVID infections. That said, we need more studies to gather data that can better inform policymaking. As an example, online surveys are, are a useful method to gather data on the impact of COVID and nighttime work, such as the one we did last year in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, as part of a study with the Inter-American Development Bank. The second lesson is that cities need need to diversify the pool of actors responsible for enforcing social distancing measures, not only the police. An example is Amsterdam Square Hosts program. It's a group of volunteers that patrol nightlife districts to help de-escalate violence and conflict. And nowadays they also remind people to keep their distance and to wear masks. And finally, this is a great opportunity to test new models of socialization. Cities like Amsterdam and Barcelona, there are scientists holding experiments to test safer, way, safer ways to resume concerts and massive events. And in Bogota, the city is planning several pilot projects to reactivate its nighttime activities such as restaurants, shops, and also logistics. So I hope these ideas will invite planners and policymakers to see the night not as a threat, but rather as a space to reimagine safer, more inclusive, and resilient cities under the new normal. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andreina. And thank you to all the students for presenting this wonderful work. Um, and it's really fascinating to see how everyone's approach sort of overlaps and see how people blend together the term resilience in, in, in relation to political aspects, cultural resilience, and environmental. Um, for the sake of time, we're gonna we're gonna ask that students and presenters answer some of the questions of the Q and A uh, themselves through the through the section the Q and A section, um, and we're gonna wrap up uh, this session to move on to our next uh, session, where we will see uh, two case studies in community based projects in South America and discuss strategic actions for tangible transformative change and embracing resilience in diversity. And also we will share some of the, uh, oh, all of the links uh, and contacts for the students and, and for everyone who wants to reach out to the students and talk about their work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. It has been very good.